We're moving on with Unit 1, Section 7 in this second video. This time we're going to be focusing on radius, an atomic radius, ionic radius of atoms and how they compare to each other. Now, this is our little cheat sheet that we had earlier where we have effective nuclear charge if we're comparing atoms that are you know, left and right across from each other. And if it's up and down, we're going to talk about electron distance. So if we want to define what atomic radius is, it's the average distance from the nucleus to the outermost part of the electron cloud. Now, if you want to compare these two right here, here we have magnesium and barium. Which one is going to have the larger atomic radius? Well, it would be the one that has more occupied energy levels. So it's barium. So the ones toward the bottom of the table have the larger atomic radius. The ones toward the top of the table usually have the smaller radius. Now if we're comparing atoms that are left and right across from each other, like potassium and krypton, well, the ones toward the right have a greater effective nuclear charge and are able to pull in those electrons more tightly. So the ones on the right, like krypton, are going to be smaller. And then the ones on the left, like potassium, are going to be larger. Now, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here is a graphical representation of what that would look like, more or less drawn to scale. So here we have the representative elements and their atomic radii in picometers. And so as you can see, the largest atoms tend to be toward the, the bottom left, like cesium and rubidium and barium over here. And the smallest atoms tend to be toward the top, and especially the top right, like helium and neon. Of course, hydrogen's much smaller. You know, all these over here in the top and right, those will be the smallest. And so that may help you to remember the uh, relative values of the atomic radii. Now, let's do some explaining here, because this is something that the College Board likes to ask on their exam. Let's use atomic structure to explain why the atomic radius of lithium is larger than the atomic radius of fluorine. So once again, here's lithium, and here's uh, fluorine, much smaller, less than half the size. So why is it? Well, remember our cheat sheet. Our graphic shows that if it's left and right, we need to talk about, what's that factor? Effective nuclear charge. So we would say that you know, both of these atoms have two occupied energy levels. However, since fluorine has many more protons than lithium, fluorine has a greater effective nuclear charge. So what's the result of that? Well, that means that fluorine is going to have a greater force of attraction between the nucleus and its electron cloud, able to, and it's, it's able to pull in those electrons more tightly and make its atomic radius much smaller than is the case for lithium. So that's how you'd answer that question. Now let's try this question. Use atomic structure to explain why the atomic radius of iodine is larger than the atomic radius of chlorine. So let's go back to our graphic here. Here's iodine. And here's chlorine. Iodine is more than 30% larger than chlorine. So why is that the case? Well, think back to our graphic and our cheat sheet there. If it's top and bottom, we need to think about this in terms of electron distance, right? And the, the fact that we have more occupied energy levels in the ones that are farther down. So here's what you want to say. That the valence electrons for iodine are in the fifth occupied energy level, while the valence electrons for chlorine are in the third occupied energy level. So that means that the distance from the outermost electrons to the nucleus is a whole lot greater in iodine than it is in chlorine, because you have basically more electron shells, more occupied energy levels. So there we have atomic radius. Now, here's our graphic again. Remember, this will help us to figure uh, out the reasoning. If you're talking about atomic radius, of course you want to talk about this in terms of electron shells. When you're going up and down, effective nuclear charge for left and right. 
Now, how about ionic radius? This is a little bit different because when atoms gain electrons, right? We know that electrons have a negative charge. When they gain electrons, they they gain a negative charge, and so they become ions. So when we go through that process, or when atoms go through that process, they become larger. Anions are always larger than the atoms from which they are derived. So just as an example, here's fluorine. And this is not drawn to scale, but you can kind of get the idea here. If we toss in another electron here, and now we have F negative, notice how the ionic radius changed. It went up almost a double to what it was before. So why is that the case? We only added in one electron. Why is the radius so much larger? Well, think about it in terms of the electrons. If you have more electrons, you have more electron-electron repulsion. Right? Electrons repel each other. So that means that they're going to try to spread out farther from each other. So here's your explanation. The fluoride ion has more electrons than the fluorine atom. So it's, even though they have the same number of protons. So we have the greater electron-electron repulsions in fluorine that are going to allow those electrons to spread out farther. And as you can see, it's a big factor here. Now what about positive ions, cations? Well, those are the opposite. Anytime you have an atom that loses electrons and becomes a cation, well, that cation is always going to be smaller than the atom from which it was derived. So here's sodium, for example. Sodium has 11 electrons. If you take away that last electron right there, here's what's going to happen to it. It gets a whole lot smaller, a lot smaller, as you can see. So once again, why? I bet some of you can probably just look at this and, and, and see that we have lost an entire electron shell, haven't we? That third occupied energy level is gone because that was the only electron that was in it. So we've lost an entire energy level. And it also has to do with the fact that we now have more protons than electrons in our, our cation here. So we have a greater or a more effective nuclear charge. And so take a look at that answer there. It says that sodium, the sodium atom that is, has more electrons and more occupied energy levels than the sodium cation, even though you have the same number of protons. The sodium ion has its outermost electron in the second occupied energy level, while sodium, the atom, has its outermost electrons in the third occupied energy level. So there's a certainly more repulsion, more electron-electron repulsion over here than there is over here. Imagine it, if you will, like a tug of war. Over here, in this left example, it's tied. We have 11 protons and 11 electrons. So it's tied. Over here, in the ion, we have 11 protons and only 10 electrons. So the protons are winning. And so they're able to pull in those electrons more effectively. Like I said in an earlier video, the only job that protons have is to keep the electrons from flying away. And here, in the ion, they're doing a much more effective job at that. Now, once again, here's a graphic to help us see how that works. In almost every case, the negative ion is larger than the positive ion. And one thing that you might notice is that the more positive the charge, the smaller the radius. And so we can use that to help us make some predictions as we go forward. So let's compare these two ions right here that we've just discussed. The sodium cation on the left over here. And then we have the fluoride anion on the right. And we can see what happens to the electrons here. We had that electron configuration. It loses uh, one electron to become 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then fluoride was like this, 
and it's going to gain one electron to become 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So you might notice that these two ions actually have the same electron configuration. Now when that happens, we say that these two species, these two things here, are isoelectronic. Now that's just a fancy word that means they have the same electron configuration. Same electron configuration. So if that's the case, why is the sodium cation so much smaller than the fluoride anion? Well, you probably know if you've been watching these videos so far. You know it's not really going to have a whole lot to do with those electrons as it does with the protons, that nuclear charge. And if we throw that into the mix here, we see that there are 11 protons in the sodium cation. So the protons are winning that tug of war. They're able to pull in those, those electrons much more tightly. Over here with the fluoride anion, looks like the electrons are winning. And so they're able to spread out and get as far or actually farther apart from that nucleus. So that's the nuclear charge part of this. So we have a couple questions. Which of the following species is not isoelectronic with krypton? So for a question like this, your, your periodic table comes in handy. And we know that krypton has 36 electrons. And so if we just look at our table, we can see that the one that would not have 36 electrons is the potassium ion. You know, K is, normally has 19 electrons, but since it's lost one with the plus one charge, it would have 18. So that's why potassium is the answer on this. The, uh, you know, sometimes they'll toss that onto an AP exam, a question like this. How about this? Rank the following species in order from smallest to largest in size. So notice that they're all versions of fluorine. And one giveaway here is that you might remember that the one that's the positive or the most positively charged is the smallest. And likewise, the one that's the most negatively charged is the largest. And so the easy way to do this is just, you know, the one that's the smallest is the most positively charged, which is the F plus. And then just a regular fluorine would be next. And then F negative is next. And the largest one is the ion that has the most negative charge, which is F2 negative. So that's how we can rank those species. Let's try another one. Let's arrange these following ions in order of increasing size. So once again, we might take a, just take a quick look at our periodic table here. And notice that all four of these are isoelectronic with each other. They all have 18 electrons. So that means that we can just assume that the one that's smallest is going to be the one that's the most positively charged. So that would be calcium. So calcium 2 plus is going to be the, the smallest. And then we have a K plus that's slightly less positively charged. And then we have a negative one. And then the largest is going to be the one that's the most negatively charged, which is S2 negative, which also happens to be the one that has the fewest protons. That's the reason that's the case. So here we're able to arrange these in order of increasing size. I hope you've learned something about atomic radius and ionic radius in this video. Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you like the video or at least learn something from this. And I hope to see you in the third video over Unit 1, Section 7.